morning, everybody. Good morning. We're going to get started. I'm Mark Levine, uh, pleased to be the new chair of the City Council's Health Committee. Very excited about this hearing. Um, pleased that we're joined by Dr. Matthew Yujing, council member and fellow member of the committee, and uh, excited about our topic today. Um, we are going to be uh, looking at um, uh, the uh, racial disparities and health outcomes in New York City and the important work of the Center for Health Excellence in addressing those inequities. Um, this is a topic I'm excited to start off with for my inaugural hearing and uh, one of many pressing concerns that we'll be addressing in this committee uh, from the opioid crisis to the lack of health insurance amongst uh, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers uh, and much else. Um, now to the big picture. With the overall health and longevity of New Yorkers improving over the last decade, um, we have unfortunately seen unacceptably high inequities in outcomes. Um, and uh, a persistent uh, inequalities in health outcomes among racial and ethnic communities and socioeconomic levels in our city. The level of disparity in maternal mortality illustrates this point vividly and painfully. In New York City, African American mothers are a shocking 12 times more likely to die than white mothers uh, from complications related to pregnancy. And tragically, the infant mortality rate in 2015 was three times higher for non-Hispanic blacks than for non-Hispanic whites, and 2.3 times higher for Puerto Ricans than for non-Hispanic whites. Um, not sure why we have the data on Puerto Ricans and not all Latinos, but uh, a disturbing point nonetheless. Even the current flu epidemic, the worst our city has seen in years, is impacted by inequality, as the vac vaccination rate for African American seniors is 19 percent lower than that of white seniors. We also know that health outcomes can vary dramatically based simply on your zip code. A child living in West Harlem in my district is eight times more likely to be hospitalized for asthma than a child in Borough Park. Adults in West Harlem are six times more likely to be hospitalized for diabetes than, they are, than those in Greenwich Village and Soho. And despite a decrease in infant mortality across the city, the rate in West Harlem is still almost five times higher than the rate on the Upper East Side. DOHMH's Center for Health Equity was created to tackle this injustice head on, pursuing a four-pronged strategy. First, internal reforms of the department itself to help staff directly confront racism and other forms of discrimination. Second, neighborhood-based strategies to deliver public health services at local offices in East Harlem, the South Bronx, and Central Brooklyn. I was so pleased to tour the East Harlem office last week, uh, an extremely impressive operation. A third, the creation of strategic partnerships with faith-based groups and other community organizations. And fourth, communi communication strategies which shine a light on racial inequities in our health system. What progress have we made since the center's founding in closing the racial inequity gaps in health outcomes in New York City. Which of the center's programs have demonstrated the greatest impact? In what ways can we extend and deepen our efforts in order to make further progress in closing the health outcomes gap? We'll explore these and other critical questions in today's hearing as we work towards our common goal of ensuring that all New Yorkers, regardless of background, can attain the highest level of health. All right, I'm going to ask our committee council now to swear in our administration, testif uh, those testifying for the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levine and members of the Health Committee. I am Dr. Aletha Maybank, Deputy Commissioner of the Center for Health Equity at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And on behalf of Commissioner Mary Bassett, we thank you for the opportunity to testify 
And I'd also like to recognize Council Members Eugene, Barron, Amfrey, Samuel, and Powers for your commitment to health and the well-being of New Yorkers, but especially a commitment to health equity. And I also want to give a shout out uh, to our, our partners that are also here, um, because the work that we do really is in partnership with those who are here in the audience and really wouldn't be possible. And for those who don't know, there are slides that we have as well with our, our testimony. Much like other cities in our country, but at the same time unique in its own way, New York City is best understood when appreciating the distinctive characteristics of our respective neighborhoods. These characteristics that we can be proud of and promote, but also those that illustrate significant differences in the lives that are being lived across these same neighborhoods. An 11 year gap in life expectancy currently exists in our city between the financial district in Manhattan and Brownsville in Brooklyn. Stark inequities exist across other key outcomes like infant mortality, premature mortality, as well as health conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and mental illness. We refer to these disparities in health as health inequities. They are a consequence of well-documented social inequities that exist at the neighborhood level. They include concentrations of poverty, differences related to education and housing and incarceration. We call these drivers the social determinants of health and they often keep our residents from living their healthiest lives. We have known for quite some time that health inequities are not a biological phenomenon, but are the result of long tenured systems of racism that have segregated and assaulted communities of color. During the history of our institutions and government, unjust policies and practices have yielded inequitable health outcomes. So dismantling systems and structures that perpetuate injustice requires a commitment to equity beyond equality. We must recognize that people do not start their lives with equal power and privilege. And without the advancement of equity and what is fair and just, there can be no equality. While the national conversation regarding inequity is often characterized by class, particularly in regards to wealth, in our city, inequity is particularly and principally a matter of racism. The history of the New York City includes the systemic segregation of people of color into neighborhoods that were deprived of resources for decades. To this day, these neighborhoods still carry the burden of decisions made through the prism of racism. At the beginning of Commissioner Bassett's tenure, she committed the Department to Equity, Justice, and Inclusion. The principal demonstration of this was the formation of the Center for Health Equity. The center prioritizes the department's work on the elimination of health inequities, which are rooted in historical and contemporary injustices and discrimination. And with that commitment came the understanding of the city's historical role in executing injustice and our present responsibility to undo it. The center's first role is to reform our own institution. We are working to transform the health department into a racial just multicultural organization that actively promotes the cultures and needs of communities that have still been oppressed. These include communities of color and the LGBT community. Our second role is to expand the narrative around what creates health and make injustices visible through the department's data. We seek to elevate the stories of those directly affected and the efforts to confront it. The third role is to invest in neighborhoods with some of the worst health outcomes in our city. As a city agency, we also recognize our influence to inspire and encourage change, to encourage change, sorry. Our fourth role is to engage sister agencies and other institutions and to provide guidance and support on how best they can advance equity and health in their work. To support health on the local level, we cannot just be deciders, but far more often we need to be followers and supporters. And today I want to share with you some of the efforts of our reform with our institution and also how we are investing in our key neighborhoods. In 2016, the Center for Health Equity launched Race to Justice, our internal reform effort. We understand, as mentioned before, that structural racism is the fundamental cause of health inequities in our nation and through this initiative, we are learning more about how racism operates within our institution. That is why we are engaging staff in conversations about race, power, and privilege, we are also facilitating trainers to improve staff capacity to undo racism and gender bias, and to recognize how implicit bias affects us all. Finally, we are fostering leadership for racial and gender equity and advancement. The department is working collaboratively with experts in this field and other cities engaged in similar efforts all across this country. 
In order to ensure dissemination and sustainability of this effort, we have organized a diverse group of core team members and staff champions from across the department, and their work is really focused on four particular areas, communications and organizational identity, community engagement and partnerships, workforce equity and development, and equitable contracting and budgeting practices. A key part for implementing race to justice is really normalizing conversations within the department around race, gender, and LGBTQ issues, as well as power, privilege, and equity. Since we began this effort in 2016, over 5,000 staff have received some form of training on these topics, and we anticipate that all staff will have received training over the next three years on racism and gender equity, which is in alignment with the city's race and gender equity legislation that was passed by council in 2017. And we commend our council as well as administration for moving forward on this important issue. This learning and lens is already starting to change the way we do work at the health department. Our epidemiologists have changed how they present neighborhood level data to show more clearly the inequities that exist across the neighborhoods. The most recent community health profiles show data by community board, the local geography that parallels what most New Yorkers identify as their neighborhoods. This has made the data more accessible and readable for residents and advocates alike. Our emergency preparedness staff have revisited how the city organizes and deploys staff in the event of a public health emergency or a natural disaster. And they are working to ensure that qualified leadership is equitably, equitably located in all neighborhoods across New York City in times of crisis. Our early intervention program provides services to children under three years who are experiencing developmental delays and disabilities. And after documenting an unequal pattern, the early intervention staff ask questions about, well, why are black children not utilizing these free eligible services in the way that Latina, Asian, and white children were in the city? The program is now building demand by getting out the news about these free services and educating providers in prioritized neighborhoods. While we are not the first institution to seek to become a racial just organization in the country, we have started a transformative process. It is one that we are working with our sister agencies to amplify. However, we cannot wait for our institutions to transform. We must also serve the communities who need help now. That is why we are also focusing efforts in neighborhoods that have long experienced public and private disinvestment and have endured some of the worst health outcomes in our city. Our recently established neighborhood health action centers stand on the shoulders of the district public health offices that were established in 2002. It also draw on the history of over a century ago of the district health centers in New York City. These were started under Mayor LaGuardia and these were meant to serve those too poor to pay for private doctors and make additional resources available to physicians working in these neighborhoods. The district health center movement sought to institutionalize coordination between city agencies, community partners, and the neighborhood residents in order to foster collective action. And so for over a decade, the district public health offices, which are located, were located in South Bronx, East Harlem, and Brooklyn, developed and implemented program, conducted primary research, and participated in coalitions, and worked with other city agencies on local projects, all at the neighborhood level. And many strong initiatives started within these offices and continue today, including our New York City Teens Connection, our Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program, which started in the South Bronx, recently expanded to Central Brooklyn and Northern Central Island, Staten Island, and the program's reach and impact continues to grow. Teen pregnancy rates in New York City declined 60% from 2000 to 2015, and the racial disparity has narrowed considerably. Asthma continues to be the leading cause of hospitalization, emergency room visits, and absenteeism among our children. The East Harlem Asthma Center for Excellence has served the needs of thousands of children with asthma and their families since 2008. And from the period of 2008 to 2014, the program graduates have experienced significant reductions in emergency room department visits and hospitalizations due to asthma. In Brooklyn, our office worked with the Department of Transportation to facilitate a participatory planning effort to bring 28, by, 28 miles of bike lanes to Brownsville in East New York. Neighborhoods with little infrastructure in the way of supporting active transportation. 
This effort was critical to promote physical activity, but also to give residents increased freedom to move about the city. Our team is now working to ensure that City Bike expands fairly by promoting accessibility and affordability to neighborhoods that could also benefit from bike share. We have also sought to elevate and address a major concern of residents and ours, which is gun violence in New York City. Our Cure Violence program provides alternatives to violence. It's a neighborhood-based health intervention focused to decrease violence and shift community norms around violence within the neighborhood. The program is now in 18 sites in neighborhoods that have historically been impacted by gun violence and gun-related homicides. This neighborhood-based approach, which is also in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, is part of the reason why there are only 290 murders in New York City in 2017, compared to 335 murders the previous year. It is because of all these successes, and really the persistent gaps that we still see in health inequities, that we are committed to focusing on these neighborhoods and figuring out even better approaches. And to this end, last year we launched our Neighborhood Health Action Centers, in which we've taken underutilized department buildings and revitalized them by co-locating community-based organizations, city agencies, and clinical health service organizations all under one roof. We have introduced new activities and programs in these sites and centers, and they possess convening spaces for the public to hold events, family wellness suites that offer support to mothers, families, and, their, and fathers, and plans also for community kitchens and teaching kitchens. We see partners are meeting and they are organizing and they're mapping out their efforts within and outside of our walls. The action centers are located in respective neighborhoods of Tremont, East Harlem, and Brownsville. Through co-location of services and programs, we are better able to collectively serve community members, act as an engine of improved asset linkages, identify gaps in coverage, and reduce duplication of services. A key partner in this effort has been NYC Health Plus Hospital, whose health centers operate in several of our locations. And, we, and having IDNYC on site in East Harlem and Tremont has brought many New Yorkers into our doors. We have also brought on a team of community health workers and staff to support neighborhood residents to navigate what is available in the building and to refer them to additional services within our neighborhoods. Governance councils are being formed to provide partners and residents an opportunity to guide our work so that we can work in partnership and have it be more meaningful. The East Harlem Action Center has numerous co-located partners, some of which are in the room today. These partners include the Association to Benefit Children, Concrete Safaris, Public Health Solutions, and Smart University. The Departments of Health, Departments of, Department of Health's Harlem Advocacy Partner Program, which is our Community Health Worker Initiative, provides over 800 residents in the, our NYCHA developments with one-on-one -on -one coaching and over 1,700 residents have participated in group wellness activities, such as Shape Up and walking groups. And over the last year, the East Harlem Action Center received over 16,000 visits. The Brownsville Action Center has a particular focus on reducing racial disparities in the rates of infant mortality and severe mater maternal morbidity. The Action Center features services provided by our co-located partners like health and hospitals, adult pediatric clinical services, and Brownsville multi-service family health centers, HIV care coordination, cardiology, and nutritional services. Another center partner, Brooklyn Perinatal Network, provides emotional support, programming, and peer education trainings to neighborhood women and their families. Over the last year, the Brownsville Action Center has received nearly 14,000 visits. And at our Tremont site, we are providing primary care as well as teen pregnancy and opioid overdose prevention. I'm proud to announce that last week the Action Center was officially registered with the state as an opioid overdose prevention program, delivers monthly overdose prevention trainings to community members. The Action Center is also a steering committee member of the Hashtag Not 62 campaign. This campaign supports borough-wide efforts to improve the health of Bronx residents. In addition, we are elevating the history of the neighborhood. Earlier this month, we launched uh, an exhibit called Undesigned the Red Line. The interactive exhibit explores the history of structural racism and wealth inequality, how the designs compounded each other from the 1938 redlining maps until today, and how residents, our partners, and other stakeholders can come together to undesign these systems. 
Over the last year, the Tremont Neighborhood Health Action Center received over 8,000 visits. The action centers also operate as critical conduits to amplifying other work of the health department in our neighborhoods. Throughout all action centers, we have focused and outreach to residents to help them prevent and control diabetes, and we work with the National Diabetes Prevention Program to support 10 community faith-based residents and organizations who deliver year-long workshops for community members, reaching over 65,000 New Yorkers each year. And in addition, the Action Center serves as a hub for training community members in mental health first aid and also connecting visitors to mental health services. Over the last year, the Action Centers have collectively welcomed over 37,000 visits and provided over 500 referrals. We welcome all residents of our neighborhoods and surrounding areas to visit us soon. And in the words of the Action Center's public awareness campaign, we encourage our neighbors to be heard, be powerful, and to be here. This is just the start for the Center for Health Equity and the Neighborhood Health Action Centers. A lot of work is being done, and of course there is much more work that we need to do. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and it's an honor to lead this important mission, and I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner, for uh, your testimony and for uh, your work on these important issues. Um, it was wonderful to see uh, you and your team in action at the East Harlem facility. Uh, I see we have Dr. Maniengo here as well. Um, uh, great to see up, up close uh, the kind of impact that being on the ground in the community can have. Um, and I do want to focus on impact. Sure. Um, understanding that we are tackling problems that haven't just appeared. They've been decades and generations in the making, and they have myriad causes, many of which are, are, are tied to some of the most ingrained problems we have in society, right. um, which, you, which you have acknowledged and um, been quite upfront about appropriately. Um, but having said that, it's important to track our progress on closing these gaps. Mm -hmm. um, how is it that you measure our city's success towards closing gaps and outcomes um, where we see such wide disparities based on race and geography and other socioeconomic factors? What are the indicators that you're looking to? Thank you. So as you, as you clearly state, um, you know, health inequity and, and solving health inequity is something that um, we all have a responsibility towards because we're very clear that what creates health um, has something to do with health care but not sufficient, something to do with the, health, um, the public health system but not sufficient, but also factors related to housing and education and other social determinants of health impact um, what's going to happen at the neighborhood level. And so for us at the health department over the years, you know, we've, we have our surveillance methods and our community health surveys that I, I mentioned earlier with our community health profiles that are issued every year. And that's one way we've been able to measure um, trends over time and also our vital statistics, um, a key role of what a health department um, does. What we're clear about though, what, you know, needs to happen moving forward is how do we think about how do we better integrate um, and find ways to collect and, and look at other data from other institutions that also impact the work um, at a neighborhood level. Uh, and the city is definitely taking a lead in that, I know through the mayor's office of um, operations and looking at social indicators and how they impact um, health at the neighborhood level. And then we ourselves as a health department also for the first time um, did a social determinant of health um, survey as well. Specifically for the neighborhoods and for um, us and what we're able to do at the action centers, what we've been fortunate to have um, is a research and evaluation team at each one of the action centers. And over the years, they've been able to, um, at minimum and maximum at times, measure definitely and evaluate our programmatic work and how it's been successful. And what's what the opportunity is that we've had is to really pilot a lot of initiatives at this very local level 
and figure out if it works. And if it works, then how can we replicate it across the city? And a great example is the New York City Teens Connection, which really started in the Bronx. But because it did such a wonderful job, um, it was recognized nationally. And the CDC actually funded us um, at one point in time to really expand it to other areas across the city. And so those are the ways that we've been using our data to really demonstrate impact, but then also um, grow our programs. Um, we've also been able to look at, and I mentioned earlier, our asthma initiative um, in looking at the neighborhood level and from the time that our Harlem Center has been present um, from 2008 to 2014, they've been able to actually show um, they were at one point in time first in hospitalizations from the ages of four to 14 and now they're actually fourth, which is not great, but it's better. Um, and they were, used to be first um, in terms of ER visits and now they're fifth for um, ages zero to four. And so we're able to measure again, like on the programmatic level, what that impact is and what's been happening um, with the residents. And I mentioned earlier about cure violence and the reduction of violence at the community level. And then we also have our programs and our newer programs such as Harlem Health Advocacy Partners where again, we're, we're piloting an initiative um, uh, within uh, our NYCHA houses within Harlem over five developments. Um, and this is a community health worker program. And from the first three years that we have had that, we've been able to demonstrate now at this point in time that we have seen increased satisfaction um, among um, our clients, but we've seen in improved control of diabetes um, and increased connection to people to follow up um, with care and also improved self-reported health, which is pretty um, um, it's significant and important to us. And then another program I just want to highlight that we've been able to demonstrate success with, which is in Brooklyn, and this was just published recently in one of the journals, is our doula program, um, which actually helps support um, uh, our mothers and, and babies to, to live, want babies to live past their first year of life, and also to support mother's health. But we've been able to demonstrate um, lower rates of preterm birth, which is a key driver to infant mortality. Um, as well as lower rates of um, low birth weight itself, and then also improved patient um, satisfaction in their engagement with the hospital. So those are very specific ways um, in which we're able to do things at a very local level, figure out what's happening, and then figure out how, to, how we can replicate it if possible. And if, and if we find that the results aren't good, then how do we, we um, change it around in order for it to kind of do what we would like for it to do? Right, and th those are all incredibly impressive um, and I, I know that you have a data orientation which uh, throughout the agency, which is what it takes to do successful public health policy. Mm -hmm. um, you and your, in your remarks cited um, trends on asthma, on teen pregnancy rates. Um, I'm not sure whether you cited diabetes, but that's also a, a well-known area where mm -hmm. there's a real disparity. Um, I mentioned in my remarks um, some very painful reports recently about disparities in um, deaths and childbirth, mm -hmm. um, as well as infant mortality rates, which has been a, a long-standing uh, mm -hmm. area of disparity. Um, so I want to pause and acknowledge we've also been joined by our wonderful new colleague here on the Health Committee, Keith Powers. Um, uh, <coughs> can you give us the global view on where we're at on disparities <laughs> amongst different racial or socioeconomic groups um, and any of the areas I mentioned or others that you might feel are relevant? The global view? Um, <laughs> I, would, I would say and frame it kind of in our New York City context, and then you've, you've said it as already before, that many of these inequities have persist, been persistent over time. I mean, the great thing about public health and in New York City specifically We've made huge improvements of health overall, um, and, and for the most part, with the exception of maternal mortality, um, health has been improved in this city. Uh, but the challenge is, and, and for all the reasons that we mentioned earlier regarding social conditions and then the structures that impact those social conditions, we're very clear that neighborhoods are still pretty much suffering within the context of New York City, and these gaps still exist. You know, that's why we're here as a center to really have some more intentional focus and figure out what is the it that we need to do in order really to, to close those gaps. Um, and I think you know our placement at the local level has really helped us have a better pulse um, on what is happening actually with people, develop the relationships that are needed in order to have community engagements and solution development. 
um, that is more meaningful. I mean, it, historically, a lot of our institutions have been very top down and very you much, you know, this is what we need to do, this is what you need to do as a community, and it hasn't really worked. I think overall we've been able to show advances, but not really at the nitty gritty at, at the local level. Does the mayor's management report include metrics related to inequities? I believe it includes measures for inequities, but I could get back to you just to be specific. I think they're working on, because of the racial and gender equity legislation, we have been speaking with the mayor's office to figure out how do we, what are the metrics that need to be in place um, that better um, outline what we're doing as an, as an administration, especially as it, um, we move forward to kind of figure out what are we going to do around this uh, legislation and how are we going to implement it at the city agency level. Are, are there any um, metrics on the MMR that specifically relate to your team to the, or to the Center for Health Equity? Not specifically to the Center of Health Equity, no. Right. So, so the health department metrics are about broader public health issues, but um, right. but not directly related to your center. Well, I'm going to pass it on to um, uh, my colleagues for questions, um, and then I'll come back for more in a minute. But I I think that we can both recognize the incredible complexity in moving the needle. On, on public health outcomes in general and, and certainly specifically related to inequities. Um, and it wouldn't be fair uh, to, um, to expect that. Uh, I, th I think your, your East Harlem office has been open for less than two years. Do I have that right? The, the current in the current right, form, the yes. Current I mean, form. It goes back a century. But right. it, w it wouldn't be fair to expect us to, to solve um, public health inequities in two years on the ground in a neighborhood. Um, no. But having said all of that, um, we gain a lot by tracking our progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the data might not be pleasant um, and might even show that we're not making uh, progress uh, when you look at the big picture. Um, but better to confront that. Um, so that perhaps it forces us to allocate ever more resources or push the envelope in other ways. And, um, and, and later I do want to talk about the resource piece, but, um, um, but if, if we learn that we're not making sufficient progress towards closing the gap, then we have to ask what more we can do, uh, what more resources we can allocate to make the kind of progress that we need and deserve. So, I know that our colleague, Dr. Eugene, uh, has questions, and I'll pass it off to him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I want to commend you for your leadership in addressing this uh, very important issue. And I want to thank also uh, Dr. Alita. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and all the members of the panel. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank also all your colleagues uh, for the wonderful job they are doing thank for you. the people of New York. We all know that health uh, equity is a very big issue, very big one, affecting people from all across New York City and all five boroughs. In your testimonies, testimony, you say that uh, the neighborhood health actions centers are located in the respective neighborhoods of Tremont and East Harlem and Brownsville. What prevents you, you know, the, 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 the department to open also the neighborhood centers in other areas, since we know that this is an issue that affects people all over New York City? Mm -hmm. And when do you expect, when can we anticipate that those very important centers will be open also in other neighborhoods of New York City? Great question. Um, so we have focused on these three areas because that's where the data um, has guided us initially, uh, and that's what we initially have funding for. Um, we are definitely certainly open to discussing um, sites in other places and, and funding for those sites as well. We do also do other work in other places in New York City, even though we don't have physical neighborhood health action centers, just to make sure that um, that is highlighted. Um, our Brooklyn space also works um, out of Bedford um, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, as well as Bushwick. And then we also have um, programming through Cure Violence, as well as the National Diabetes Prevention Program and our faith-based work, as well as New York City Teens Connection um, in uh, areas of uh, 
uh, Queens as well as in northern Staten Island. So even though we don't have a physical framework um, and structure of a neighborhood health action center, uh, we do definitely have a present in other neighborhoods across the city in recognizing that there are other areas that are also experiencing tremendous inequities. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, uh, we know that in, in health and medicine, language or languages are very important. Let me put it, communication is very important. If you are a doctor, you are seeing a patient, you cannot communicate, this is a big problem. You may be the best physician that you can be. If you don't understand your patient, the patient doesn't understand you, this is a big problem, and this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. I saw you have been talking about all the, the progress, all the strategies that you know, the, 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 the department is putting put together, is putting in place to address the equity issue. What about languages? We know that in New York City, New York City is, I say that all the time, is home to so many immigrant people talking different languages. And those immigrant people, they have their own culture, their own languages. People, let's say in the Caribbean people, and the Caribbean people, when they come over here in terms of uh, preventive medicine, in terms of going to the doctor, they have a different opinion. They have a different opinion. I'm telling you, you can ask many people in this room. Mm -hmm. So what uh, the department is doing to fill this gap and to address that issue, that the health equity is addressed in terms of cultural you know, uh, issue, language issue, because those immigrant people who are contributing to the fabric of New York City, they are facing barriers. And among those barriers, culture and languages. Absolutely. So several things. It's important also to understand the role of the Center for Health Equity. And so while um, this is definitely Commissioner's strongest commitment um, to ensuring that the, the health department has a focus on it, we are not the only ones responsible within the health department to make sure that equity is pursued from the agency's perspective from the health department. And so there are many others within our agency that are also doing work um, around language access um, and ensuring that all languages or as many as we possibly can get are available for many of the materials that we have in terms of communication. But also what happened um, as a result of you know, pursuing this lens of health and racial equity, and I use Ebola as the example of, of when that um, came around a few years ago, that it was well recognized that maybe, and we were getting feedback from community residents as well and some of our internal staff that were from West African countries who were um, experiencing um, Ebola among their family members and, and we're going through a lot of trauma. And we really took it upon ourselves to make sure we were listening to exactly what was happening. And part of the feedback was what we were providing as communication materials may not have been given the message that we want to give. And so we actually took a step back and worked with community members to make sure, one, it was in the right languages and the various languages that it needed to be in, but also language is also about the symbols and the designs and, and what are the pictures on something and what does that communicate. And so we, we made sure that we evolved that and, and reissued that. And that was really all um, with the support and the help of many of our, our community members. And so this work um, about equity is also pushing us as a health department across the board, not just us as the Center for Health Equity, to really challenge how we're creating um, the materials that we're creating and making sure we're putting a racial equity lens to it. And oftentimes that means that we can't create materials in silos and that we have to go to our neighborhood residents and our partners to get input on what is working in terms of our materials and what is not working. Yes, I do understand that you are not uh, your institution or the those centers. They are not the only groups or institution addressing the language or cultural issues. But are you working together? Do you collaborate? Oh, absolutely. Could you, you mm -hmm. could you explain? Could you give sure. us more detail about your collaboration with those institutions to make sure they address properly the health equity issue? Which institutions? Um, you say that you know the uh, uh, health center. They are not the only institution addressing the language issue, if I understand what you said there. What so I was my saying question is that, is that mm -hmm. are you communicating with those other groups, those other neighborhood groups or community groups, to make sure that you work together, you join forces to better address 
addressing the, the, uh, the health equity. Yes, sure. so in the example that I was explaining, I was, I'll talk, I talk fast so I can talk slower, I know. Um, I, I just want to know a little bit more detail about what you said. Right, and so I, I'm gonna bring it, because it was a really uh, a powerful uh, um, push for us. And so our health department, as, and I'm, not I'm talking about the Center for Healthy, health, health Equity and other folks within the health department, mm -hmm. heard back from our community-based organizations, our partners within the community, um, we specifically reached out to many West African organizations uh, to hear from them uh, how what was happening in terms of just in terms of dealing with all that was happening with Ebola and knowing that many of their families were dying back home, but also learning from our partners and our community-based organizations what are some of the best strategies that we need to take on board in order to make sure we're getting the messaging out in a proper way. And part of that messaging relates to language, um, but language in terms of literal um, words and um, you know the type of language, but also the visual part of the language. And so we, through the feedback that they provided us, made sure that it was in the proper languages, both the words, but also the visuals that were on the particular um, promotional materials that were, we were putting out. And so we've worked very closely with our community partners in terms of getting feedback on how we can evolve what we're doing and how we can do it better um, <coughs> as compared to you know, before in the past. Uh, you, you mentioned Ebola, that was one event. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, what you mentioned, that was the reaction, you know, on, on the aftermath of Ebola. But what I'm think, uh, talking about is that we have to be proactive, preventive, and I love preventive medicine, preventive medicine. So what I'm talking about is before the event, Got in it. your strategy, in your strategic planning, do you work together with other organizations to prevent, to be proactive, not when something happening, you communicate with neighborhood, we do something. Do you have in your plan, you know, are you aware you communicate, you work together, you sit down together with the different organization and say that, you know what, languages are very important in terms of providing, you know, help to the people. What can we do together to make sure that people who are not speaking English properly can benefit from the services that we are, we are providing? That's what yeah, I'm talking I'm about. clear now. So yes, um, and a lot of the work in the partnerships through um, our neighborhood health action centers have those relationships up so that when program development is happening, we are influenced by what is actually happening within the neighborhood. We have evolved um, several of our materials and have gotten feedback from Harlem specifically more recently. Um, there's a large Mandarin community that we are uh, learning about and definitely um, engaging more with and making sure that we are proactive in producing and developing materials, but also figuring out what we need to do better in order to address and work with the Mandarin community, which means language is a context that we have to be very um, aware of. We also um, have hosted mental health first aid um, in Spanish um, to make sure that we have been responsive to the needs um, of our communities and within our neighborhoods. Um, and so there are many moments and, and efforts that we have. Most of our, oh, another actually really big thing, the National Diabetes Prevention Program um, nationally actually didn't have um, the program in Spanish, and so we were the first ones here in New York City to do this program, this prevention program um, in Spanish and make sure that it was offered and it actually influenced national practice as well. So we definitely um, prioritize that prioritize making sure that what we do is accessible on many levels and every level um, with our community partners. But a lot of this we've really learned and been pushed by our community partners at the neighborhood level due to the relationships that we've had over the years. Uh, I'm looking at something you know, from your uh, testimony that I mm -hmm. love. I'm gonna read it for you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you say that in order to ensure our dissemination and sustainability of this effort, we organize a diverse core team of oh. staff, champion from across the department. It's wonderful. That's yeah, answer yeah. my question, you know, part of my question. Mm -hmm. And you say that your work is focused on four areas, mm -hmm. communications and organizational identity, community engagement and uh, partnerships. Great, partnership. Mm -hmm. And also workforce equity and the development and equitable 
contracting and budgeting practices. My question is, are diverse is this team you're talking about? Are diverse is this team? Mm -hmm. The component of this team. Do we have people from across the, 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 the communities? Or the, we cannot get everybody. But, mm -hmm. you know, we have to, when we create a team to address equity, to address fairness, and regardless of the department, we got to make sure that we include as many people as possible. People from all over the place, all ethnic background. We won't be able to include everybody, but as many people as we can. But our di this is my last question. How diverse is the team, this team that you're talking about? How diverse is the team? Okay, so to clarify as far as, as far as that core diverse team of champions, we're referring to folks within our agency as the health department. Um, you know, oftentimes within, when you have a program within anything, um, we tend to, as leaders within an institution, pick who we feel should be a part of a team to lead the work internally. And this is part of our internal reform effort to become an anti-racist organization. So in a way to do it different, we opened up, oops, we opened up the application process for our entire employees, the 7,000 employees across the agency, that if they were interested in helping to lead some of this work to become an anti-racist organization, that they could, they could apply and be a part of it. And so we have team members that are from, we have 13 divisions within the health department, we have team members that are from all divisions as well as from different levels of management or employment staff across the agency, um, different years of how long they've been in the agency, gender, race and ethnicity, that are a part of this core team um, that are, are that's transforming our own institution. Um, in addition to, I think, what you have mentioned, uh, over the years, again, and through the action centers, um, we have developed lots of relationships and have lots of diversity in terms of who we engage with at the neighborhood level. Each of the action centers are now um, really working towards how do we build um, councils uh, that are going to that we are going to work with, but also inform our work in more direct ways. Um, and they have been engaging with neighborhood residents on best how to do that. So instead of us saying that this is how it should be done, we are going to the residents in our various areas of whether we're working in faith-based organizations, um, NYCHA developments, community-based organizations, even the schools, and getting ideas on what should we do in order to engage people around the action centers to make sure that we're doing the work in the way that's most that's best for the neighborhood, um, but also that's best for them as organizations and residents within the neighborhoods. Thank you very much, uh, and I do appreciate all the efforts you know, that has been done to make sure that uh, the the team is diverse. But you say something that you open the application for people who are interested. But I think this is our moral obligation as city, as government, as leaders to do the strategic planning in the way the, that we include people, not because they're interested, but we have to have the, the plan, the strategic plan to include everybody. It is our moral obligation. And I said I want to be put an emphasis on that. We won't be able to include everybody, but as many people, as diverse people as we can. Thank you very much for all the effort that you are doing, and thank you for your thank answers. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eugene. Want to acknowledge we've been joined by our colleague on the Health Committee, Councilmember Inez Barron, and I believe that Councilmember Powers has a question. Yes, thank you, and uh, uh, congratulations to our chair on your first hearing, right? Yeah. Uh, and glad to be part of this committee, which obviously is addressing a lot of important issues. And I um, thank you for the work you're doing. I walked in midway, so I apologize for missing parts of it, but uh, I walked in right and talked about infant mortality and other issues. Um, uh, and I know that in the report, uh, it's actually my district that does particularly well here in terms of when you talk about the equality gap and recognize that uh, the work you're doing is to help make sure that every district has those um, same opportunities. Uh, just a quick question, and then I'll pass it back to the chair, is uh, we talked about the infant mortality rate. You noted that uh, 2006 to 2015, a decline in it citywide amongst all poverty groups. I didn't see a reason or reasons maybe listed in terms of things the city had done or programs that we invested in or if it's other reasons that uh, led to a decline in the mortality rate in that 10-year period. Sure. Um, well, over the 10-year period, I mean, I think we've had improvement in, in health in many different ways. But I would say um, we've done a lot of work and a lot of efforts across the city. We have a newborn home visiting program um, that was launched 
ooh, maybe 15 or so years ago um, that also focuses on visiting moms shortly after um, they have de delivered um, as well as um, in their home. So they visit them in the hospital as well as in the home. We have other programs such as Healthy Start Brooklyn that has had a lot of focus on Brooklyn and working with partners to help support um, programs such as Nurse Family Partnership, which is a well-known, well-established program that's not only in Brooklyn, but other places across the city. And so there's been lots of um, very pointed efforts um, in New York City to have um, a focus on infant mortality and especially within the neighborhoods um, that we know have the highest rates. Got and it. working and uh, working a lot with partners also um, in, in planning around what needs to happen within the neighborhoods. And to be very clear, and there are a lot of partners within this room, there are a lot of people across New York City. Um, we have perinatal networks. We have other people who are also um, working with Healthy Starts within other bureau, boroughs that have been doing work in home visiting and, and um, counseling and all types of work across the last, uh, over the last couple of years um, and really drilling down and, and highlighting and calling out that infant mortality is not just and it's not right for black babies to be dying two to three times more likely than, than white babies. And so moving forward, we're doing um, really elevating um, this, this effort and really working towards being more collective um, across city, the city government, but also with our community partners to develop um, plans that are more cohesive and coordinated um, and focusing on areas such as safe sleep and housing and focusing on really women's health. There's been a huge shift in understanding that what really drives infant mortality within um, the city, but also the country, um, is how healthy a woman is before um, she gets pregnant. And then also a recognition that um, structural racism has a tremendous impact on um, a woman and her family within the context of her neighborhood um, that leads ultimately to chronic stress and, and chronic disease. And so we feel in elevating that narrative, it also creates a platform that we're all, uh, more able to come together, but also for other people to see how they can be part of the solution in uh, decreasing infant mortality in New York City. Hey, thank you. And one, one more question is, I, I, there was a question I, I actually walked in was we were talking about the doula program. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sort of vaguely remember last year at Bellevue, which is in my district, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a program that was cut or lost. Mm -hmm. um, and folks reach out to me about it. Uh, uh, I think it was at Bellevue. Do you know if, any sense of what I'm talking about? There was a, uh, or folks that were associated with Bellevue. I can, I'll follow up with okay. you in a, in yeah, a, in a offline, but um, there was some concerns about cuts to a program that I think the city was investing in. And I can, it was a while ago, but I'll, okay. I'll follow up with it. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Great, thanks. thanks. Thank you, Council Member. And I believe that Council Member Barron has a question. Yes, thank you to the chair. Welcome. Thank you. Look forward to continuing to work on this issue with you as the new chair. Uh, to the panel, thank you for coming and sharing. It's, it's, I think it's very important that we recognize as a part of the document has said that the health department's work is to eliminate health inequities which are rooted in historical and contemporary injustice and discrimination, including racism. I think that's important that you have that in your statement and that until we recognize that and the implications of how all of that has filtered into what we've been doing all these years, we're not going to make significant progress. I think I heard you also say that the social and economic conditions of the community contribute to chronic stress and other conditions that have a negative impact on a person's health. So part of the reference material says that 28% 23% of black patients give birth, only 23% of black patients give birth in the safest hospitals. So we know that a part of that is based on the lack of or the poorer health conditions that we have in our poorer communities. How is your division going to address the issue of maternal mortality? How are we going to be able to reduce that? Do you see it related not just to the mother's, uh, the mother-to-be's health condition prior to giving birth, but also to conditions that exist in those hospitals that are in our poorest communities. Right, so for the health department is having a lot of focus and I'm gonna ask Dr. Torin Easterling, who's overseeing our birth equity to come up to kind of expand a little bit more. 
But um, we as a health department have definitely elevated this issue and we have recently um, convened a mortality review or maternal review committee um, to really focus on looking at cases of why women are dying um, in New York City as it relates to childbirth and making sure that there's definitely more intentional to find out more in depth what is happening so solutions can be put forward and those uh, meetings have happened um, more recently. So that's something that's, that has started. Um, and we have been fortunate to re receive as a health department and for New York City, and this was just announced, um, more funding to support how we um, collect data and how we look at data um, to better understand what is happening at the city as a whole, but also understand what is happening in the hospitals. And then there's a lot of intention right now um, from the health department to build relationships with hospitals and meet with them and to convene with them to talk about um, what, is the, what are their systems like and what are the potential gaps within their systems that are not supporting um, women to be the healthiest that they can be or, or what's not supporting the women to get the best treatment that they could get potentially within the hospital system. So that work is also happening. And then at the neighborhood level, there has been lots of convening. Do you wanna come and talk? Um, I've, it's, I feel it's good for you to meet some other people too, because they're- I know, I'm very familiar with Dr. Easterly. It's glad that he's here. Do you need to swear in there? Yeah. And yes, we'll just have the committee council do the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And since I'm new, Dr. Easterling, if you could explain your role. Uh, well. Sure. Uh, good morning uh, to the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Tori Ann Easterling. I am the assistant commissioner for the Brooklyn Neighborhood Health Action Center within the Center for Health Equity. Uh, and I also uh, work within our division uh, with other colleagues within our department. Uh, to lead our birth equity initiative uh, through New York City to really think about how we're addressing uh, the racial inequities around infant mortality as well as maternal mortality, which is getting directly to Council Member Barron's question. Uh, and so as the data already um, uh, points out and we have already highlighted multiple times uh, that the inequity still exists around maternal mortality as well as infant mortality, I, I think it's important to, to highlight that the division continues to work to engage our community partners around how we think strategically about the work that we do in our neighborhoods. Through our neighborhood health action centers, we, are, uh, we have established the family wellness suite, uh, which are convening spaces for women and their families to think about how we provide resources and also to think about how we uh, provide respite spaces uh, for families. Again, getting to the chronic stressors that we know that exist uh, within our neighborhoods uh, the other role that we are planning, uh, playing around convening uh, is using data to really think about how we identify, uh, one, the root causes of these inequities, but then also to think about some of the interventions uh, that have played out and addressed some of these inequities. Uh, thinking about Healthy Star Brooklyn, newborn home, home visiting, but we know that we have community partners who have been leading home visiting services, who have been providing perinatal support, uh, as some of our partners who are here right now who are leading a lot of this work within our within high need neighborhoods. So really thinking about how we use data, that is what we call uh, the perinatal period of risk report. Uh, and just to get back to uh, the council member Eugene had mentioned how we're thinking about how we inform, how we present the data. A lot of this data is well known, but we wanna provide a racial justice lens to ensure that what we present comes with a, with a lens that people understand and how we can think about action steps. And so that's another example of how we're using our community input before we put out data, because a lot of people know this information. Uh, but just to get to specifically to the question around hospitals, uh, it is important that we play a role. Uh, as you know that the New York City Department of Health has partnerships with hospitals. We have hospitals within Central Brooklyn who are faced with this issue. Because they are safety net hospitals, they are, for, they are dealing with lack of resources and capacity to really address this issue. Uh, I, I think that this, it's important to acknowledge that we have provided some input into the Vital Brooklyn Plan to ensure that we elevate this issue because there is funding that is coming down from the governor's office. There is an opportunity as we're thinking about uh, the merger of, of three hospitals within Central Brooklyn and other safety net hospitals, there are best practices that can be integrated into their plan. Um, but we need to have, uh, you know, other, our recommendations taking cons uh, consider consideration into their plan uh, and brought to the table as well. So I think that it's an opportunity to really address 
uh, sort of the racist practices that we've seen in hospitals, but also to also think about some of the best practices that we've seen across the country as well. Uh, thank you. That's, that's a part of the concern that I had because, as you know, Brookdale is one of the three hospitals that's a part of that. We want to make sure. I think there's a meeting that's going to be held even Thursday where, where the legislators from the state are going to be coming together yeah. and working further on that vital Brooklyn plan to make sure that we're aware of all of the indices that show right. that we have a great disparity in terms of the services that are given to black and Latinos and how can we use that data to make sure that we uh, can improve what's done. So thank you so much. And I appreciate the work that you've been done, that you've been doing, and the event you had last year uh, at the Health Center was fantastic. So I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to it as well. Yeah. Maybe I'll get an invite. Yeah. OK. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Um, uh, Dr. Maybank, uh, collecting data is one of the core functions of, of your department. You're collecting data from <coughs> emergency rooms and other hospital departments, from medical labs, from probably pharmacies and uh, environmental monitoring, uh, uh, from thousands and thousands of sources, I'm sure. Um, to what extent do we have demographic data attached to that reporting? If um, for example, heaven forbid, uh, we should have a pediatric death from the flu. Uh, I know your department learns about that, but do you also learn uh, the race or other demographic data about um, the, the child in such a case? And, and is that a, a universal uh, practice across all data collection? Many, much of our data collection within the health department has um, race and, and ethnicity or demographics attached to it, um, and it's been that way at the health department for a long time. What other data sources um, do and how they collect their data, uh, we're not able to fully control or have, have a sense of what that is going to be, but we definitely have better data when we do have demographics attached to that data. Um, so, so for the health conditions that we've spoken about today, uh, um, mortality from heart disease, uh, from asthma, from, from diabetes. Uh, do, do we have full coverage of demographics in, in that data collection? We do. I mean, we have pretty good demographics. I think we can always improve, um, and I think that is the challenge um, and the work of racial equity and gender equity and, and how we collect data. Um, you know, right now, for the most part, we have very broad categories, especially as it relates to race and ethnicity. And we're very clear that there are many, um, I don't want to say uh, subgroups, but other groups and other ways in which people define themselves. So as an example, Asian is a very broad category. But many folks who identify as Asian also that come from different origins and different nationalities in which, um, you know, health plays out potentially in a different way. The same thing with Latinos, as you mentioned. The same with, with blacks. And so I think there's always an opportunity to get more granular in how we collect demographic data, um, whether it's even around income and where people live, um, and how, you know, how micro can we really go to understand what's happening within a specific area and among a specific population, uh, I think is an important challenge for us as folks within the health department. So there are always opportunities um, for improvement and to strengthen our collection around data uh, within uh, New York City. And who sets those rules? Who, who determines uh, just what demographic data is reported? And you, you brought up a great example of Asian being such a broad term that it can sometimes obscure very important differences. Um, when, uh, when you receive reports from hospitals or from medical labs, are they following um, rules that the health department sets on exactly what kind of data to report? Right. We don't have, there are certain kinds of data that we have um, influence on and in saying that we need to collect it within New York City. But in terms of demographics and how agencies and institutions collect their data, one, it's, it's going to be important to go to that institution and find out what their source is. But oftentimes they have a source and guidelines that are provided and requirements of what they need to collect data on and how that data is per, um, presented. We as the health department definitely have some level of control over how we collect our data and what it is that we're going to present. And we can always push ourselves as the health department um, to do better. Uh, but also we can, we can work with other partners to see what they're doing. And I think we can work collectively to push one another to say this is what we need to collect in order to have a full spectrum of, of the picture. But not everybody has to do that. And there are not requirements always and guidelines to, to go deeper. 
uh, understood. Um, uh, Dr. Magnendo has an MBA, I think, right, among his eight or nine other degrees. So they, they, they teach you in business school, if, if, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And so um, I really would like to ensure that we are measuring um, uh, the demographic disparities in health outcomes in this city. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, even if what it tells us might be painful, uh, that's the first step to addressing it. Um, so I look forward to working with you and your team on pushing the envelope on that, on first making sure that people are reporting um, the full uh, richness of, of demographic information, and secondly, that we're, we're aggregating that from a citywide perspective um, and reporting it, um, perhaps in the MMR or other outlets that I'd like to explore uh, further with you. Um, uh, I want to just shift to the budget question for a moment. So. Uh, your, um, your team or the Center for Health Equity has a $14.5 million annual budget, is that correct? Correct. And so that would include um, your on-the-ground programming and your community outreach and, and your communications work and even the um, kind of in internal uh, um, efforts you've made to, to, um, to change the dynamics around uh, confronting racial inequity. That's all under this single budget of 14.5 million. Right. Um, so you've probably never heard uh, this in a city council hearing before, but that sounds like uh, not a lot of money, uh, <laughs> c considering <laughs> um, considering that, well, one, the scale of your operation, but even more importantly, the scale of the challenge. Right. Um, and uh, can, can you break out the piece of that budget which is going to your neighborhood action, health action centers? I'm going to refer to, so Cassie Toner is my assistant commissioner over um, division management and over finance, so she's sitting here okay, specifically and, and to, to, to answer these them. questions. Great, and sorry to do this, but if we could also have you do the yeah. affirmation. Mm -hmm. you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And, and sorry, again, new guy. So you're the assistant commissioner for? Division management, which includes the budget. For Got the it. Okay. Um, so, you know, very specifically, the, the new funding that we have for the action centers is one million per action center. That funds our staffing model, which is a critical part of the, the action center model, which I'm sure you got to see at the, in East Harlem, which is our navigators, our promoters who go out into the community, our referral specialists who are doing all that exciting work on making sure people get the social services they need that, of course, are the, address the social determinants of health. Um, the rest is really split among our programming and has existed prior um, so NYCTC, our New York City Teens Connection program, our, all of our various programs have their own um, individual budgets, and a lot of that goes towards the action centers. Um, but as a whole, the action center model was funded at one million per year per center. Okay, so um, that must mean that we're leveraging that money um, partly through nonprofits, which we partner with, who take up residency in these centers, which brings about great synergy. Um, in terms of the staff that you're funding with that, what would be the, the, the approximate headcount we're getting for a million dollars a year in those centers? We have about 11 staff um, that were added per center. Okay, got it. Well, considering they're medical professionals, I'll also <laughs> say they're something you're not used to hearing. They're clearly not being overpaid. So that, that's good to know. Um, but boy, that sounds like an incredible bargain. And so it leads me to ask, why instead of having only three at a million dollars a year, don't we have 30 or 50 um, considering the enormous need and what sounds like a pretty reasonable cost per, yeah. per center. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I think we're, you know, right now we have the three um, and we are always open to discussing more and, and how any ideas that you may have around funding other action centers across the city. Uh, I know that there's a, there's a capital need. Um, and we were lucky, I think, in all three of these locations to uh, have a, a legacy of a, of, a, of a facility that was created, in some cases, 100 years ago. Um, are there more, uh, if that's the right term, legacy facilities out there that might need a renovation, but at least they're, they're in our inventory that we could bring back to life? Yes. There are? How many more are there? 
Uh, <laughs> I can kick it back to you with that number. Okay. And we can talk more about that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, is, is that a politically sensitive question, or is it just that you don't have the number offhand? It's fine if you want to get back to me, but... There's a mix. I don't have the number offhand. I mean, I have a, an estimate, but I think there's, you know, I, we can get back to you. Do you know at, at the height of, of what at the time was very innovative with this district office, mm -hmm. dis district health office program, do you know how many facilities we had at, at a peak? Yes, uh, there were about 30, a little, little over 30 facilities across the city. And so you, you were at the flagship program that really was, um, it was a pilot initially, initially in the Red Cross approach to the health department. They showed success over actually three years initially, and then the city funded the building of the building at the Harlem site. And it was really from that success and demonstration over 10 years of a decrease in infant mortality and premature mortality that the city felt that they needed to invest in other um, health district health centers across the city, specifically in areas that they knew had the worst health outcomes. And at that time, um, many immigrants and, and blacks and, and um, Latinos lived in those neighborhoods. Well, there's no doubt that these are priority areas, and 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 uh, I, I, you know I applaud you for putting your resources where the need is greatest, but. Um, just to understand, so, thir so at, at 30 facilities, um, are, are they currently abandoned? Uh, what, what is the use currently for these facilities? So over time, um, it, you know, and I would have to get back to you as far as the number of facilities exactly and, and speak to our admin um, people to have that number more exact in my mind. But in terms of over time, what we've experienced as the health department is that there was an underutilization of the buildings. You know, we have gone through periods of where the health department has been very centralized and then decentralized in the early 1900s and then became very centralized again. Um, and, you know, we did offer a lots of health clinical services, but as you know, we're not really in that business so much anymore. So those buildings became even more underutilized. Um, and that when Dr. Bassett came back on board in 2002, uh, there was a recognition that we can't be so centralized any longer as a health department um, because we're, one, because these disparities exist within these neighborhoods and we don't have a sense of what's really happening because we don't have teams that are really present there um, to be within the spaces to, to talk with people and to work with people in a very intentional way. And so she, her attempt um, with what we call the district public health offices at that time were to, to at least at minimally with what she could have decentralize as best as she can and then when she came back on board, um, again, having a commitment to a neighborhood pr approach and figuring out uh, what it is that we can do. So while it definitely, you know, you know, could be more, I will say it is more than what it was uh, three years ago um, in our commitment as a health department to what is happening um, and being present at the local level where we know disparities exist in the city. Right. Um, look, the health... The public health landscape is always changing, and today, if you look at the top, as you well know, the top preventable diseases, they are things like heart disease and diabetes and um, uh, gun violence, unfortunately, is high on the list. Um, and to combat them, I think there's a stronger argument than ever for being on the ground in communities. Um, we need to impact things like diet and exercise um, and to be present in neighborhoods, uh, there's just no substitute for it. Absolutely. Um, and so it, it, it may be that there was an argument for centralization in a different era when we were combating a different list of top diseases, but boy, it sure feels like what we're struggling with today, um, that you couldn't do all that from your wonderful building in Long Island City. Uh, and I'm sure you agree, it's part of the rationale for your, for your office. but. Yeah. Um, you know, I would certainly like to explore with you, and I'm getting lots of nods from Councilmember Powers, um, the, the, the idea of, of dramatically increasing our on-the-ground presence, and we've, we've had a proof of concept now in three neighborhoods, and kudos to Commissioner, Commissioner yeah. Bassett for, for re-envisioning what a local office can be in, in the 21st century. Um, but now we've got a couple years of experience. Um, there seems to be enormous demand. Um, as evidenced by the 16,000 visits a year or 15,000 visits a year. So uh, we've answered that question. You know, the people, the communities want this, obviously, and they're willing to come in. Um, so let, let's, let's work together on finding a way to, 
to extend this success in other neighborhoods. Absolutely, and we're working to make sure, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, that we're definitely evaluating um, the model and, and what it is, because uh, it is unique in having co-located partners um, and the clinical entities and the community-based organizations. But I also want to say, if I'm allowed, um, that it's important to understand that, you know, we need to be present in the neighborhood. It provides another opportunity to work with other city agencies that are also in the neighborhood. Because if we understand that all of these other things impact health and create health in terms of whether it's housing or um, education, um, mass incarceration, that it's not only the sole responsibility of the health and the health field to um, create and resolve and decrease the gap in health inequities. And I think it provides a wonderful opportunity for us as the health department to work with our city agencies to actually help them put a health lens and understand the health impacts of their work. And we have had, we've led some of that work under the leadership of Dr. Ha Dr. Yeah, me did Dr. Javier. Um, Javier Lopez, who is one of our assistant commissioners, um, who has done great work. It's not, it's not health in all policies per se, but it's health in all policies like, um, in which his team of some city planners have worked to build capacity of other, other city agencies to just understand what creates health overall um, and, and all that that oftentimes people really aren't clear about. They think health is just about the health care system and the hospital, but also to understand the equity impacts potentially of their, their work. And what it has led to over the last year is um, these plans that have come out through the city, our Bushwick plan, our Brownsville plan, you can see their explicit call-outs for health now and health inequity within their, in these plans. Now, how that will materialize to action, not completely clear, but at least it's a start that we're able to you know, get the city agencies to start seeing this particular lens. But that's an area, I think, that um, in, if we're pursuing health equity um, and we're really focused at the neighborhood level of, of achieving, uh, closing these gaps, that we also have to figure out how are we working with other city agencies to implement a health lens. Um, on, on the funding uh, front, al almost every agency, I think actually every agency in New York City gets some federal money. Um, but I got to imagine that for the health department, it's, it's um, quite a large portion of your total budget. Um, one program that I, I believe is funded federally uh, through the CDC is the Teen Connection Program. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on um, the risk that we face from a, a hostile um, White House and Congress, who I'm imagining are undervaluing um, the kind of important public health work that you're doing, and whether uh, we've actually uh, have already taken hits on federal funding through the Teen Connection Program or others? Yes, so we've learned that um, the program will be cut um, nationally uh, and it, funding will end this coming June. Uh, so, you know, and it impacts uh, a large part of uh, work that we do. Uh, we reach currently 15,000 young people across New York City um, through uh, linking um, community health centers with high schools, um, making sure that teens have access to and are, and are utilizing their local um, health care centers, but also ensuring that these health centers are also teen friendly and responsive to young people. Um, and we've been working with DOE to implement um, curriculums that um, help promote um, racial justice, but not ra well, racial justice and reproductive justice, um, and ensuring that young people understand and know their sexual and reproductive rights um, and, and will access information um, in the way that they need to. And then we've been working with young people to also be leaders of this campaign um, to develop communications campaigns across the city. So this cut will have um, a tremendous impact on our ability to engage with teens across New York, New York City. And as I mentioned before, this has been one of our successful programs in which we started you know, in one area and expanded in others because it demonstrated tremendous success and we have seen you know, decreases just definitely within the Bronx teen pregnancy rates, but also um, across the board in New York City. And, and so what is the budget of that program, and is it entirely federally funded, and has that now all been canceled? So I'm going to call up uh, so that you get to meet another assistant okay, commissioner, because I'm proud. You're going to get to meet I've, almost all of them, hopefully. All right. um, Dr. Jane Bedell, and she's over our um, Bronx office, who has been really the leader and pioneer in pushing this program and creating the model. Good morning. Uh, 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And so, Dr. Bedell, you're running the South Bronx Health Action Center. Is that your role? That is my okay, role, and it. in that role, now that New York City Teens Connection is, has expanded, I'm also, you know, what we call the lead assistant commissioner for New York City Teens uh, Connection as well. Okay. And so these budget questions, what is the budget of the program? Yeah, so the budget is approximately $1.2 million. We were first funded from the CDC at a slightly uh, lesser uh, uh, annual budget, uh, and uh, then the this work at the federal level moved to another part of Health and Human Services, the Office of Adolescent Health, and we got even more funding when we applied for a grant there. We're in the middle of our second year, and we've been, you know, like our colleagues across the country, uh, rudely told that our five-year kind of guaranteed funding is not really guaranteed and it's going to end in June. So devastating to so many, the many municipalities. As of now is set to close June yes. 30th. Yes. Have, have we not looked at a plan to replace the funding either with city money or another source? We yeah. are pursuing looking at a plan. Yeah, so we, we, we are in negotiations and talking about how we might be able to uh, fund some of it. I, I, I don't, it would be hard to, to get CTL money that would be as um, richly endowed as the federal grants are, and also to say that the federal grants have with them this ability to do some connecting with other cities and municipalities that look like us and to learn from them. So even with uh, if we are able to get funding to continue the program, there are aspects of the federal funding that are very important to, you know, nationally. Uh, and we, at least during this uh, presidential administration, are unlikely to be able to be learning from our colleagues across the country. P please keep us posted on this. Uh, it would be tragic if the program was discontinued. Yeah. I think it's important to prepare alternate financing if that uh, does come about. Great. Um, yeah. Please keep us posted and, and let us help if we can. Okay. Appreciate um, that. Uh, we haven't talked much about uh, the specific healthcare challenges faced by LGBTQ New Yorkers. I know that is part of your mandate, and I think you have a task force that is specifically addressing that. And I wonder if you could say a word or two about um, the how you characterize the challenges for that important segment. Of, um, of New Yorkers and, and what your role in addressing it is. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to call my other director and assistant commissioner, Javier Lopez, up. But in the meantime, before he, he comes up, um, what we've been able to, to work at, and this was really under the leadership of uh, uh, Count Johnson, uh, who was committee chair before, um, really highlighting and recognizing that we need to have very specific efforts to, uh, with the LGBT community and that we need to have teams and staffing that are working in that way. And so, you know, he designated and city council designated um, and, and asked that there be liaisons at the agencies and we took that on. But we also made sure that we also provided additional funding and actually have more of, more of a team than one person. Um, and so what the responsibility of this team is, is one working internal to the agency um, and making sure that we're coordinating efforts. And so we have a lot of work actually coming out of the health department through our Bureau of HIV that has um, issued a health care bill of rights um, through some of our mental health first aid work. Also working very closely with the Unity Project with the, with the ladies, first lady's office. Um, and then making sure we just launched um, Out for Safe Spaces, um, in which we're working with community-based organizations. I brought the prop, <laughs> so everybody so can get the training, <laughs> and you, you, the city council could become an Out for Safe Spaces space. All right. So <laughs> working with um, community-based organizations and clinical, um, and hopefully clinical entities, um, to make sure that they are building their capacity um, so that they are responsive and relevant for um, our LGBTQ and TGNC um, communities um, and especially our communities of color. Uh, we have been working with faith-based organizations as well as our Cure Violence partners um, to elevate and build their capacity to talk about um, the stigma uh, as it relates to LGBTQ and TGN uh, communities and really address masculine toxicity um, as well. And so there are different ways in which 
you know, we're working to coordinate within our agency. We're working and we're liaisons with the mayor's office, with first lady's office, with the commissioner of gender equity. We're also working internally um, to train our own staff. We have now um, a gender um, equity module um, that staff um, have to actually complete. Um, most, I think many staff across the city have to. Um, and our teams help develop um, this particular training module. Um, and then we're also working, as I mentioned, with, with the Unity Project. Javier, do you want to? Okay. So I, 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 think, I, I guess I, think, I handled it. I think, I think you did a okay. uh, thorough job there. That's thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Maybank, and to the uh, great team that you brought forward today. I really look forward to working with you on these important issues. Thank you. Okay. And we're going to call up our next panel, uh, which is uh, Juan Pinzon from the Community Service Society, um, Mary Luke, and uh, Sheila Katzman. Uh, b both are from Cedar, uh, New York. Okay, welcome to you all. Um, we're going to have a, a three-minute clock on, on you all, but, but uh, will there be time for questions as well? And would you like to kick us off? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sheila Katzman. I am the president for the International Association for Women in Radio and Television, USA, and the chair of the steering committee for the New York City for CEDAW. We're a voluntary community-based coalition advocating for women's rights, women's bill of rights in New York City, based upon international standards embodied in CEDAW, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. First, we wish to express gratitude to you, Council Member Mark Levine, and for the Council in general for inviting us back here again. Uh, we also want to focus our bit here on mental health and um, want to emphasize our appreciation to the First Lady Shirley McRae for the initiative on mental health. Allow me to highlight three specific articles of the 17 articles of CEDAW that have particular resonance to women's health and mental health, which always seem separate. Article 12, health care and family planning. Countries must guarantee equal access to health care and ensure women and girls are not discriminated against in health care and have access to services. Article 13, economic and social life. Uh, and then, and lastly, art Article 16, marriage and family life, because even listening around, I didn't hear any of these things coming out. Could the results of discrimination over time lead to mental health problems? Uh, preventing women from reaching their potential and tying girls into early marriage, which we know plagued us some time here, could result in depression and or other mental health problems. Having said all that, with a gender assessment, New York City Procedure Act would require the DOM, DOHMH to pay close attention to trends and make sure problems and proper, uh, are properly identified. Um, the, too often the media is inundated with news on mental health. However, we are concerned that these reports usually refer to men and to men who are privileged, like the Las Vegas shooting, shooter or the most recent shooter in Florida. Mental health becomes a major topic when we speak of homelessness and mental health, the gender is male. We are concerned that women will be overlooked or worse, assume their needs without asking them. 
race and gender clarifies who can be identified as having mental health problems or being merely a violent criminal depending on race and gender. Too often, uh, women are dis the discriminated majority. Historically, mental health has been used to take away women's voices with egregious uh, practices of drugs and even institutionalization. Thankfully, we are no longer at the place, that place, but we wish to ensure that this can never happen again. Our major ask is that each city agency and department assess their work through a gender lens. The city is a major employer. The city is a major implementer of programs. The city is a major funder of projects. In each of these areas, we want to ensure that gender discrimination is a thing of the past. A key component to any gender assessment is access to disaggregated data. There are many areas that may be inadvertently overlooked, and a gender assessment will ensure that nothing is missed. A gender assessment will help the city and the public to identify these problems and allow the city to take action. Gender assessment needs access to access to data that is disaggregated by gender and is accessible to the public. Lastly, we recommend the Department of Health in its collection of data broken up by gender and wish for its continuance for the public access to raw data. We would like to ensure that this data collection is incorporated in law and not just policy so that future administrations may not easily change this forward-looking strategy. We know that other forms of discrimination aggravate problems of gender, so we recognize that intersectionality also requires disaggregation of data by race and other traits that have historically discriminated against women. We would also ask too that when we get these invitations, which we got pretty late, that we get some back up background information which we got when we arrived here. Thank you. Okay, well thank you um, Ms. Katzman for your testimony for bringing this very, very important issue to light. Um, if you haven't already, uh, let's make sure you also connect to our Committee on Women's Affairs. Maybe we could have a joint hearing at some point. Uh, they have a wonderful chair in Helen Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we can team up to look at um, uh, gender concerns or the concerns of women as they relate to health uh, more broadly and would certainly love to have you as part of that conversation. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, is it Ms. Luke? Is yes, that right? Yes. Okay, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner, and congratulations. Um, and I'm just a lowly city council member, oh. not a commissioner. <laughs> but, uh, That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I'm, um, I am the president of the U.S. National Committee for UN Women, the Metro New York chapter, and also on the steering committee of this New York City for CEDAW initiative. And um, I think what we bring here is the global perspective and the ability to connect the global issues with the local issues, which I think you, you asked earlier about um, the implications of uh, New York City's health um, disparities um, globally. Um, so our role is to educate and advocate locally on issues that affect women and girls globally and using a gender lens to advocate for health as a human right with a focus on issues such as violence against women, sexual and reproductive health and rights, early marriage, economic and political participation. Um, so we're gonna be speaking today mainly about the importance of gender assessment based on gender disaggregated data in the planning policies and services of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, first, we really want to congratulate the Center for Health Equity. They do fantastic work, and I think we heard so much about it today, and your questions were wonderful to really sharpen the focus on certain aspects, which we totally agree with. But their uh, Race to uh, Justice initiative, their new Gender Justice initiative, all of those are things that really uh, put the lens on issues that we are really all concerned about. However, we feel that the Center for Health Equity needs to continue to sharpen its focus on planning and implementation through a gender lens to add to the focus on uh, using the race to 
racial lens. So we think that's really important to kind of put equal weight on both. The Center for Health Equity has produced a really wonderful comprehensive report um, uh, uh, called New York Takes Care 2020, and it reports on 26 indicators citywide by borough selected because of their importance to community and social justice. And this data has been captured by, gen uh, by um, if it's been collected by gender, it really has not, not been displayed by gender. So what we see is um, uh, uh, data and targets that were uh, compared to baseline by race and extreme poverty in neighborhoods. Uh, so, but, so we don't have a sense of what the gender dimensions are of that. Indicators such as obesity, physical activity, overdose uh, deaths, mental health needs are all really needing to be looked at from a gender perspective. So our recommendations are what Ms. Kaufman has already put forward. We really need to have gender analysis. We need to have gender disaggregated data. We would really encourage uh, the Department of, of Health on uh, Mental Health to work closely with the Commission on Gender Equity and as you just suggested, the Commission on Women's Affairs. We think that bringing together all of these agencies um, and commissions that really are working towards the same goal of gender and racial justice is really important. Um, and we would be happy to help in any way by also really contributing to the broader uh, global picture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Bin Son. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you to your colleagues as well for holding this um, uh, hearing on this really important work of the Center for Health Equity. My name is Juan Pinzon. I'm the uh, Director of Health Services at the Community Service Society. CSS has a really long history, um, 175 years to be more precise, you know, being the voice for low-income and moderate-income New Yorkers. Through our health programs, we help people enroll in health insurance. We have the largest navigator grant from the state to help people across the state uh, enroll in health insurance. But we also help people connect to care if they, if they cannot afford insurance. We also help them understand their insurance and make they sure that they're able to access care through their insurance. And we do that primarily through programs like Community Health Advocates and the Independent Consumer Advocacy Network. Um, All together, we serve about 100,000 100, New Yorkers every year through these programs. And many of these New Yorkers are uh, uh, people of color. Um, but I also wanted to mention that we do this through this hub and spokes model, which uh, allows us to serve consumers through a life and helpline. But we also have community-based organizations, more than 50 community-based organizations on the ground providing these services. Today, I would like to talk more about uh, one of the uh, initiatives that Dr. May Bang mentioned in her testimony. Uh, this is the program called Harlem Health Advocacy Partners, which is a very unique initiative that serves five uh, public housing developments in East Harlem. Uh, we do this with, together with the New York City Housing Authority and also with a NYU CUNY Prevention Research Center. And the goal of HAP is to reduce health disparities rela related to chronic diseases, uh, particularly asthma, uh, diabetes, and hypertension. And since two, 2014, uh, CSS uh, has served almost 900, 900 residents with more than 2,600 needs um, in this community. So we are recommending the city to expand the HAP model to other high need neighborhoods uh, that could benefit from these from these services, um, the 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 HR model is very unique because it's guided uh, by a health equity framework and employs a three prong approach to address the needs of these residents. Uh, so the model combines the assistance of twenty of twelve community health workers, three CSS health advocates, and five community health organizers. The community health workers provide health coaching to residents to residents. Uh, to manage their existing health issues and set health goals for the future. And they work with residents to address perceived barriers to health and reach their goals by providing referrals to local health and social services. The three advocates from CSS, on the other hand, provide health insurance enrollment and post-enrollment uh, expertise and assistance to help uh, residents enroll uh, and use their health coverage. Um, um, and we work with community health workers to identify those uninsured residents enroll them in coverage, and help those who are already insured make sure that they're able to use their coverage. Uh, health advocates also help residents 
residents with uh, uh, other questions about their coverage. Uh, since 2014, we have handled uh, more than uh, 2,600 cases and saved residents uh, over $170,000 in medical bills and um, connecting them to programs to lower their prescription drugs. Uh, so um, I just, I guess I don't have time to go through my whole testimony, but I wanted to end by, by saying that uh, uh, this is a program that we believe is already addressing the social determinants of health and reducing health disparities in East Harlem. And we believe this is a program that we could easily expand to our neighborhoods uh, in, in New York City who, uh, who need these services. So we hope that we can work together with the um, Committee uh, on Health and with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to make this possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. What, where are you in East Harlem? Do you have your own facility? So we're actually located in the uh, Neighborhood Health Center Got in East it. Harlem. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing uh, navigation and, and health insurance enrollment at that site. Yeah, primarily. So 96% of the clients that we're serving actually are, already have health insurance. Many of them are on Medicare, Medicaid. Some of them are on both Medicare and Medicaid. So our main function is actually helping people you know, understand their insurance, right. make sure that they have any problem with health insurance, which happens very, very often, you know, medical bills, people don't, not understanding how to access an specialist, how to, you know, access prescription drugs, medical equipment, we help people with those issues. Right. So this number I've seen is that there are 667,000 New Yorkers who lack health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's primarily adults. The kids are mostly covered by right. Child Health by Plus. Child Plus, yeah. And Many of them are undocumented immigrants, um, mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a separate challenge that we urgently right. need to address. Right. But uh, there are still several hundred thousand, I don't know the exact number, but mm -hmm. in the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who are eligible right. for, in a small number of cases, uh, Medicaid, and yeah. in a large number of cases, some subsidized insurance mm -hmm. on the exchange. Mm -hmm. So what could we do to get every last one of them insured, what that we're not currently doing. Well, we need, um, so the state already funds the Navigator program to help people enroll in health insurance and it funds community health advocates to make sure that people have access to, to care and use their insurance, but there is not really a lot of funding to uh, community-based organizations to reach out to those people who are still uninsured. Um, there is, uh, currently there is an initiative called Access Health NYC, uh, it's a million dollars that uh, gives some of this funding to the CBOs to do this outreach, but it's, you know, obviously it's not enough. So I think like what we need is, you know, more funding uh, for community-based organizations to be able to do community presentations, do home visits, uh, be out in the community and trying to get, you know, those vulnerable New Yorkers, people who are, you know, especially immigrants who, you know, with this current climate are very concerned about accessing care, about applying for health insurance, even if they're eligible. Uh, so we really need more resources to be able to, to you know, to do more outreach and reach these uh, hard-to-reach populations. Okay, well, that sounds like something we need to be investing in for sure. But uh, excellent. Well, thank you, Juan, and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And this concludes our hearing. Thank you all very much.